tours giving our uh, program today, so he is quite a draw. Okay. <laughs> uh, Jack Smith is uh, doing our program today, and he presently lives in Geeville, Mississippi. I'm sure you all have been there before. It's a thriving metropolis. Uh, he was born in Ripley, Mississippi, and graduated from Ripley High School, and he attended the the United States Military Academy at West Point, uh, and he graduated in 1970 as a second lieutenant in the um, artillery. Uh, he served in the 11th Armored Cavalry in Germany and attended and graduated from Ole Miss Law School in 1975. Uh, he practiced with the Judge Advocate General's Corps in Denver, Colorado, and he moved to Mississippi in 1978, and he has practiced law here uh, since then. He's been president of the Family Law Section of the Mississippi Bar Association, and he's the past president of the Lee County Bar Association. Uh, he's married to Sharon Baldwin Smith, and uh, they have four children between them. And uh, he is the past president of the William Gray chapter of the Sons of the American uh, Revolution, and he's a member of the Lewis and Clark Heritage. Oh, there are others here. Oh, excuse me, I'm sorry. <laughs> but he has, uh, he has climbed such mountains um, all over the world, such as uh, Mount Rainier, Mount Blanc, uh, Kilimanjaro, McKinley, where you were in a tent for a week, correct, snowbound. We didn't hear from you. We were so worried about you. Mount Fuji, uh, Pikes Peak, and the list just goes goes on and on. And Sharon is his backpacking companion, and they've hiked over 400 miles of the Appalachian Trail. Um, today, Jack is going to be uh, taking us to Gettysburg. We won't be climbing mountains, but we'll be taking a historical trip to Gettysburg. So thank you, Jack. Well, I see some of my group here today, Judge Bailey, Stephen Bailey over there, and I, Ann Cross back there, but um, yeah, there you go, Pat's mother. Uh, we've, we've been on a lot of trips uh, over the years. I got interested in Gettysburg back when Rick Menard and Tommy Gardner and I went. We have a friend of ours who I met through the Napoleon Society by the name of Terry Jones. There are only two people alive today that have a statue at Gettysburg. They have a moratorium <coughs> on adding statues. There's more statues at Gettysburg than any battlefield in America. And we have a mutual friend named Terry Jones who lives in Pennsylvania. And Terry has um, the John Gibbon statue up there. And it's kind of a funny story I, that I pulled on Steve Bailey and some of them this year. But I got interested when Rick and I went to Gettysburg several years ago. And, you know, I'd read a little about it and knew in passing we took a few little tours up there, one-day tours with some guides and everything. And all of a sudden we went to the 150th anniversary of Gettysburg back in 2013. And uh, Reed Hillen and Rick and I and Tommy Gardner went to that and, and uh, had to all sleep in one room in double beds, and the beds were about this wide, so it was not much sleep. Some of those guys snored. But anyway, we uh, went up there, and something just caught on with me, and I decided that I was going to start really uh, studying Gettysburg. And I went back. I've been, I think I've been back every year since 2013. And uh, I started really getting into it about 2015. I spent – I decided that a little learning is a dangerous thing, and I found that's true and a lot more things than just the study of Gettysburg. But um, anyway, I started kind of reading on it. And so the way to do it, I figured out, and I've got some of the books I've read. I've read all these books at least once, some of them twice, and one of them or two, three times probably. But what I did, I started out reading general works on the, on the battle. And I've kind of got these books right here separated into the different classes it's not going to be a, a book review. It's going to be, I'm not going to cover all these books, so don't run for the door yet. But I wanted to give you all an idea that if you really want to learn something, if you really want to immerse
immerse yourself into a subject. Uh, we are in living in the luckiest times in the world right now to do that. And there's so much written on the Civil War, you can get lost in it. You have to really, it's not looking for something to read. You have to cut back on something to read. You, you can spend, um, I mean, just on one little minor subject of the Civil War, there are no telling how many books on it. I mean, it's just amazing. Then you've got the Internet, podcasts, and I'll cover that in a second. But here are three what I would call excellent books uh, that are general works on Gettysburg. Now, how many people in here have read The Killer Angels? Probably a lot of you have. That's kind of an introduction book for a lot of people. And <clears throat> this year... I took eight lawyers to Gettysburg on a four-day tour. Judge Bailey went with me, and uh, I think all the rest of the guys, Judge, have probably heard this stuff before, so they probably wanted they've already it'd be a deja vu for them, as it will be for you. But I've, I've uh, I decided uh, Jonathan Martin and several of them approached me last year and said, "You're I I'd always question them. Had y'all have y'all been to Gettysburg?" And they said, "Oh no." And, I said, well, I'll take you someday. So they cornered me last January and said, you're taking us in uh, uh, May. Pick a date and we're all going. So we all went up there and had great, a great time. It was a wonderful trip. And what I told them, <clears throat> and I firmly believe, you can't understand Gettysburg in one day. There is nobody, I don't think, the best teacher in the world could not possibly cover everything in one day. So what we did... As most of you know, it was a three-day battle. It was the most, uh, it was the biggest battle that's ever been in North America. There was 160,000 men fighting in a very, very confined space at the Battle of Gettysburg. The noise of the battle was so huge. There was something like, <clears throat> my memory serves me right, like 475 cannons that were basically all going off at the same time, not counting all the men firing weapons, and the sounds were so loud on the battlefield that to relay commands, you literally had to grab the guy right here and get in his ear and scream in it to tell him what to do because you couldn't hear anything. And, and, uh, and I'll tell you why I really got interested in it, but I took these eight guys up there. I kind of pulled a trick on them. I kept telling them that uh, this guy, Terry Jones, was a friend of mine. and I don't know whether they believe me or not, but I said, Terry's a good buddy of mine. He's been to my house down here, and I see him every year or so somewhere. He's a real history expert, and he's one of the top historical sculptors uh, in America today. Uh, he's just an amazing guy. And I kept telling him about Terry this and Terry Jones that, and I had four or five Yankee buddies, <clears throat> two from New York City, two from Washington, join us on this eight-man tour. So we had uh, nine of us from the south, and we had uh, five guys from the north on this tour together. We had no fights or anything on it. But anyway, uh, these were great guys. Everybody had a great time. But I said uh, on Friday morning, I told everybody, I said, I really wish y'all had a chance to meet Terry Jones, my buddy, while he's done all this stuff and all these, I showed him pictures of all these sculptures that he had done. And I said, let's just go look at his statue. So we go to his statue, get out of the van, and <clears throat> we're looking around, and I said, now this is the John Gibbon statue, and it's a great big old statue. And I said, boy, I sure wish we had Terry Jones here. And about that time, I turned around, Terry Jones. And Terry had, uh, we had a range of and so Terry steps out, and there he is. And everybody thought I was kidding at first, but he spent the rest of the weekend with us. And what we did, we spent, uh, we got up there on one day, and then we spent all fr uh, Friday on day one, just covering what happened on day one. We spent uh, the next day on just what happened on day two, and the third day we did Pickett's Charge, the third day of the battle, and then everybody tried to go home after that, but planes got all messed up. It was just horrible. People ended up in Ohio and stuff like that, but you know how the planes are nowadays. But anyway, we had a great time, and what I asked them to do before the trip 
was I told them, why don't you read the Killer Angels? And most of them did and really enjoyed it. And then I had suggested they read this book by Alan Guelzo. And I think Judge Bailey was probably one of the few that read it. But it's an amazing work, the general work of the battle that's excellent. And here's the book that I, that I had told Babe about by Noah Andre Trudeau, which is also a very good Anticipating probably going back again this year with another group. And I, I covered day one on our trip, and I covered day two, and I hired a guide for day three. But I've gotten pretty familiar. Day three was is a lot simpler than the other two. And I want to use that word simpler. I have found, and this, this is something some of you folks like Judge Davidson will probably agree with, if you go to Shiloh, it's very difficult to understand what happened at the Battle of Shiloh. I'll bet you there's not many people in here other than in just really vague general terms can tell you what happened in Shiloh. I spent a year and a half probably studying Shiloh, reading nothing but Shiloh for a year and a half. And I did a book on Shiloh. It's not for publication because I stole all the pictures and maps out of these other books, I just did it for myself, just like I did one on Gettysburg. Here's the problem with reading history, and I think uh, it's taken me a while to figure this out, but here's the problem. There's two kind of history books, uh, and I'm, there's a branch of each of those, but you've got these general works like this, and you've got Coddington, uh, here that is a very dry but very accurate portrayal of what happened in a battle. Then you have books that are just fascinating books like this guy right here, Harry Vance. He wrote a book just on day one. He, day two was so confusing that he wrote two books on day two. He wrote a book on what happened on one part of the field that is this one battles I really, really know, and I don't pretend to know everything about it. I'm way off from some of the people that really know a lot about this stuff, but you really delve down, and I'm going to talk about this, and why did I get interested in Gettysburg? Of all, it's way up in Pennsylvania, and it's a long way from here. Most I can get up there once a year. The reason I did is because there are four historic places in America. Some of y'all have heard me say this. Pencil, uh, Philadelphia has two of them, Independence Hall, Declaration of Independence, and the Constitution. Right around the corner, arguably, is the most important spot in America in a building that was the capital of America for a while. And after George Washington got out of his eight years as President of the United States, the guy took me in. He said, oh, no, Independence Hall is not the most important place in America. I said, really? And he said, no, come on, I'm going to show you. Takes me into this other room and said, 
pointed to a place on the floor. Nothing was on the floor. It was carpet. He said, right there is the most important place in America. That's where George Washington voluntarily gave up power at the end of his term. Nobody had ever done that. Nobody. Maybe since Sinatus, you could argue, in Roman times, he's the only one. When George III, his arch enemy, heard that he had voluntarily given up power, uh, he said, if Washington voluntarily gave up power, he's the greatest man in history. And he was right, in my opinion. The third place is up at Newburgh, New York, when the army was starving in 1783. Uh, Washington was headquarters up there. It was after Yorktown, before the end of the Revolution. The army was starving. The men were mutinous. And they came to Washington and said, Washington, will make you the king of America. Washington turned it down. And the fourth place, and I think the most important place in America, is Gettysburg. That is where America was born, at the Battle of Gettysburg. Because until Gettysburg, Gettysburg sealed the fate of the South. The South never had a chance. Uh, it was like halfway through the war, <coughs> it was we were behind 40 to nothing, and we had to go through the game for two more years like a football game. But the war was over after Gettysburg and Vicksburg together. But Gettysburg sealed the fate of the South. And we became one nation indivisible, just like the pledge said. Nobody would think of, of uh, separating from the United States now, not, not seriously. And uh, one guy, a friend of mine in the Army up in Vermont one time, uh, when I was in the Army with him, said, man, Vermont would like to we would like to escape from the Union and become our own country. And I said, gosh, that's a great idea. Why don't you do that? I said, we'll come up and burn all your houses and your courthouses and steal everything you got. I'd love to, for you to do that. Y'all are a wealthy state. But anyway, nobody seriously thinks that the United States will ever break up because we are one nation indivisible because of the Battle of Gettysburg. That's important. But let me tell you what, I'm not going to try to tell you what happened as far as what unit did this at Gettysburg, so don't go to sleep yet. But I'm going to tell you, you've all read in your lives about the samurai in Japan. You've read about these warriors <coughs> who were not scared of death, who faced whatever they had to face uh, and would die knowing they were going to die. Well, we had men, north and south, at the Battle of Gettysburg, that were the equal of any samurai that ever lived, the equal of any marine that ever fought at Iwo Jima or Okinawa or Guadalcanal. These men that fought at Gettysburg, I could spend literally all day talking about them, about how brave and what great sacrifices, men that had premonitions of their own death at that battle. Uh, Colonel Cross was a Union leader over in Ward's division. He was a brigade commander uh, at the battle. And Colonel Cross was a very experienced officer. And uh, General uh, Hancock, who was the hero of, for the north of the battle, rode up to him on the second day just as his unit was moving out to the wheat field. Now, this wheat field, I'm going to get off the subject of seven, was 17 acres long, big, square, sort of a square. and. Um, 17,000 men over about a three-hour period fought in that wheat field. There was anywhere from 4,500 to 6,000 men dead and wounded laying on that little 17-acre plot at the end of the second day. You could walk across it and never touch the ground on just the corpses and the wounded men that were on that ground. And Colonel Cross was in this was where the cacophony of the battle was just so loud you couldn't hear anything. But Cross, the whole war, had always worn a red bandana uh, going into battle. He had been in quite a number of battles. He was an experienced commander. He was a full colonel. And General Hancock rode over to him that day as his unit was just pulling out of the line heading to the wheat field. And he went up to him and he says, Colonel, you'll be wearing a star before this battle's out. And Cross, who had changed his bandana from red to black that day, said, nope, General said, this is my last battle. He knew he was going to die. He didn't try to get out of it. 
he marched those men straight into the wheat field and he was dead in 30 minutes, knowing he was going to die. Uh, one of the other great stories I tell people is the story of the 16th Maine. Any of you who have read um, Chamberlain's book know that, uh, or the book about Joshua Chamberlain, the commander of the 20th Maine, that was in the, uh, uh, the book I just talked about, Killer Angel. He's the hero of that book, and quite a he's one of my heroes, a great man. Well, during the second, no, correction, the first day's battle, the Union was outnumbered, and they were up in this one area, and they had fought the Southerners for hours up there. Finally, the Southerners got their act really together and started attacking the Union line and had flanked it, and the 16th Maine was right at the where the line turned. They were right in that little elbow there. The Union line was breaking and falling back, and the, colonel, the general rode over to Colonel Tilton, the commander of the 16th Maine. He had 200 and 39 men in that regiment. And he rode up to him and said, Colonel, you have got to hold the line for a little while till all these men can get back and we can get up to Cemetery Hill and maybe save the battle. And Colonel Tilton looked out there with 230 men and he was being attacked by 7,000 Confederates who were very experienced, good soldiers. And he said, well, General, you know what this means, don't you? And he said, yes, sir. And he said, he saluted, and his men turned around, walked right back, and they fought as long as they could. Then they finally let these other men of, of their army escape back up to Cemetery Hill. They retreated into what was a railroad cut, where an old railroad was going through this hill. They got in there, and they said, you know, I'll be damned if I'm going to surrender, if we're going to surrender our flags to the Confederates, because they were just about, sur there was only a few of the men in the railroad cut, so maybe 50 or 60, and so they took their unit flag. <clears throat> Every Union unit had an American flag, and then they had a flag of their regiment. They took their regimental flag and tore it into pieces like this, gave each man a piece, they then tried to escape to Cemetery Hill, and out of that 235 men, 35 made it out alive and not captured or wounded. And so right after the war, they dedicated a little monument to the 16th Maine up there. It's not a very big monument, but uh, Joshua Chamberlain, who was the governor of Maine at that time after the battle, he was a general. He had really covered himself with glory, and he had been the commander of the 20th Maine, which is a story of itself, on the second day, now this is the first day, he was giving a speech after the war about the 16th Maine to dedicate that monument. And a lot of the veterans were in the audience and he said, uh, well, you know, I was commander of the 20th, and but the 16th Maine really covered themselves with glory and they tore their flag up after during the battle and uh, I sure wish we had that flag back. At which point, all these veterans just walked up. This was unplanned and took their piece of the flag they still had and put together as much of the 16th Maine's flag as they could. And they would not give them to the state of Maine. The state of Maine, if you Google it, uh, has been trying to acquire these pieces over the year. But that's the kind of valor, that's the kind of bravery and sacrifice. I could not tell you uh, of all of the sacrifices, both north and south, that men went into these battle, this battle you just had to know your chances of being killed were huge. The casualties were just monstrous in this battle. And <clears throat> that's what, a, it's not just, it's just a study of, I don't think I could do what these men were, I mean, I'm sitting here rational in a nice warm room and, and uh, you know, I'm, I had a good meal for lunch here. I don't know that under the conditions, because some of these units, had to walk 30 miles the night before the battle. One of the Confederate units had to walk 30-something miles and wearing 60-something pounds of equipment, their rifles, bullets, and all this stuff, and I mean it was just walking like this as fast as they could. They get to the battlefield immediately, General Longstreet, this is on the second day, puts them down on the far right and they had to attack little round top and all that area and be engaged in, I mean, the worst combat you have ever heard of in your life for hours after, the, just right after they walked 30-something miles with all that gear on. 
in the heat, wool uniforms. <clears throat> Quite a number of men died from heat stroke in that battle because of being called on to do that. But it's a study in, I, I like to call it a study in leadership. And how can you motivate people to go into almost certain death against the, the southern army at this time was the greatest or probably greatest army in the world. They were some kind of lethal group of people. And the Union Army by this time, two years into the war, they were equally experienced and equally brave. I, I could regale you with stories literally all day long about what these people did. Now, in studying this, I kind of did a few aside studies. I looked at all the lawyers that had fought the battle, and I told somebody one time, I said, uh, you know, the three, there were three Mississippi infantry brigades in the battle, all of whom were commanded by lawyers. And this guy said, well, no wonder we lost. So, <laughs> you know, but anyway, I won't say that. But I want to talk about this real quick. into the personalities. He will pull out, he'll just, you'll be reading along about what happened in the battle, and he'll say, well, General Dan Sickles, and Sickles was quite the character. You could, there have been books and books and books written on Sickles. He was kind of the Donald Trump of his day in some ways. He was from New York. He was uh, married uh, to, he was very wealthy, big politician in New York, and he was married to some just knocked out looking Italian girls about 19 years old well he catches her one day with Francis Scott Key's son and I don't know what they were doing but he took offense at it whatever they were doing he caught them doing and he chased Francis Scott Key's son across the road in front of the White House and shot and killed him and he was the first guy in American history we don't sell. We don't have a day for Dan Sickles, but he was the first man in American history to get out of a murder charge on temporary insanity. Now you reckon he did hire some good lawyers up in New York City, and they uh, came down and they had a trial in Washington, and he claimed temporary insanity and, and killed the fellow and got out of it and stayed married to the girl. I don't. I lost count after that of what happened, but anyway, Sickles was just an amazing guy, and uh, not. He was kind of a force of his own. He was the only non-West Pointer that was a corps commander in the Union Army. Everybody in the Union Army up high, right, and the Southern Army were all West Point grads except for Dan Sickles. And so Dan decided to do things the Sickles or slash Trump New York way, and he takes his unit out off the line. Meade did not know he had gone way out. The Confederates happened to hit him right there. During the battle on the second day, Sickles is up on his horse, and he's uh, getting clobbered. And a cannonball comes along and just takes his leg off. Right off, he was sitting on his horse. Never even touched his horse, but that cannonball took his left leg right off. And they put him on a stretcher, and he said, give me a cigar. And they carried him off the battlefield. He wanted everybody to think he's pretty tough smoking that cigar. I'm sure they put a tourniquet, and he lived. He lived way after the battle, and his leg was put in a museum somewhere up in Washington, and he would go every year and have a drink of whiskey and look at his leg in the museum. It's a Smithsonian, I think. I don't think it's there now, but uh, but he would go and look at his leg every year. I don't know if he'd look at his wife or not. I don't know if they stayed married or what. But anyway, Sickles was a fascinating guy, and these books will go into all this background information about the people, and those are just wonderful history. Uh, because they, they're not like the Coddington book where it's just this happened and that happened, and you really got to like it, Gettysburg or whatever you're reading to get into one of these books that are so dry, but these are not dry books. These pick up the personalities. Uh, you had cases of these young people that were in this battle that occupied high positions. Colonel Burgett was a North Carolina colonel of the 26th North Carolina, and he was killed the first day there were 13 color bearers in the 26th North Carolina fighting the Iron Brigade, the best union in the whole Union Army, and they were fighting from me to that wall, just volleys back and forth, uh, firing at that range right there. Colonel Burgett 
after the seventh color bearer had picked up the flag and been shot, Burgett, 26 years old, picks it up, takes one step, he's killed. The second in command picks up the flag, he's shot and killed. And they people just knowing they were going to be killed. I mean, you're from here to there to the best unit in the Union Army, the old black hat guys from Michigan and places like that. I mean, these were damn good soldiers. And these people would still pick up the flag, be shot, next guy, 13 in a row, picked it up. And they finally pushed the Iron Brigade back and clobbered them and knocked them back to Cemetery Hill. But just reading about these subjects, reading about what these people did. Now, I'm going to switch, pivot a second here and tell you about history books and why they're confusing. What history books do, and this is, I read a couple of books on Shiloh one time, and I thought, after reading the book, I couldn't tell you what happened. I mean, I can tell you generally what happened, but I couldn't tell you, I couldn't go out to the field like I think I can do at Gettysburg and say, now folks, right here, this is what happened exactly such and such a time, uh, these were the people in charge of what was happening, here's why it happened. The problem with history books, and reading history of battle especially, is that they're not done chronologically, because what they do, <coughs> and maybe of necessity do, <coughs> they will pick a unit, or they'll pick a part of the battlefield, and they'll start talking about it, and they'll say, well, it's 7 o'clock in the morning, and by the way, parenthetically, at all these battles in the Civil War, and especially at Gettysburg, people fight over the time because there was no uh, uniform time. Everybody had a watch. A lot of folks had watches. Not everybody, but as a matter of fact, most people didn't have a watch, but the officers and some of the men had watches. But there was no, okay, everybody synchronize your watches here today. They didn't do that. But they just had to guess at the time. That's why a lot of historians won't say such and such happened at 5 o'clock or 4 o'clock because there was not total agreement on when it happened by the clock. They could look at the sun and tell, you know, it was dark or whatever, but not by the watches per se. But now, what they do, the historians do, they take a unit or they take a part of the field and they'll say at 7 o'clock such and such happened and it went on and at 12 o'clock. Then they'll pivot around and say now, in this other part of the battlefield at 8 o'clock in the morning, such and such happened, you're trying to figure out, well, how did that affect this other group? And it all affects because you've got a long line of people fighting, and what happens down here is going to affect the people down here because if these guys start falling back, right, these guys are sitting out with being flanked, and it's a real confusing deal. And I only have one book, and I got my inspiration from this book, this is the only book I've got on day two that chronologically takes up the whole battle. And so they start out, they don't really tell you the time, but they say on this spot on the battlefield and this spot and this spot, this is what happened first, and they go to the next page. And this book is so great, it's a rare book actually, but it has a map on about every second or third page, which really makes it nice, and showing you what happened. A lot of books have lousy maps, and you're sitting there, and they're talking about something you don't even know what they're talking about. You have to stop and dig back. This book is so great because you know what's going on at one particular time on all the different aspects of the battle. So what I did, I did my own book on day one. This is my day one book I came up with, and what I did, I spent a lot of time on but, and I stole, don't anybody turn me in, Judge, uh, on the, I'm not selling it, so I violated every copyright law known to man, I think. But what I did is I indexed in chronological order sort of what happened on the battlefield on the first day, and then I would take all these different maps, some of this may fall apart on me while I'm doing this, but I came up, of course, with the units in the battle and all that, but I also did a chronology, and I broke the battlefield into three sections on day one, the southern section, northern section, and the eastern section. And so I paralleled, as I read this book, I would move facts around to say that at around 8 o'clock on the southern section, this is what was going on, northern section and eastern section. There was nothing on the eastern section at that time, so there would just be a blank there. But then I chronologically went through 
and my chronology in here is pretty long but it starts right here at uh, 4 o'clock in the morning when they started rousing the troops up and moving them toward the battlefield. And so here it is right here. This is what happened on one section. This is what happened on another section. And as more troops came in, you'll see, you'll see that more things started happening back over here. So I did a chronology with this thing, and then, of course, the rest of the book, is all of my notes on this thing, and then I would cut and paste maps to match what my notes were. So when I take this book, I can just review it occasionally, and it just brings it all back in, in focus on it. Now, uh, there are so many ways that you can learn about history nowadays. You can go to the library here, you can get on the internet, uh, you can get on Amazon, you can order books or go to Barnes and Noble or Reads and buy books there, and they can order them for you. But another way to learn that I have discovered this year, uh, Judge Bailey and I met one of the park rangers at Gettysburg who's a permanent park ranger at Gettysburg. He'll be there probably his whole career as a park ranger named Matt Atkinson from Houston, Mississippi. And I was doing a case for a fella, and I was telling him, well, uh, I'm going to be out of town for a few days in May this year. Where are you going? Well, Gettysburg. He said, oh, you know Matt Atkinson? I said, uh, no, I never heard of him. He said, well, he's a park ranger at Gettysburg. He's from Houston, Mississippi. Well, I picked up the phone. The guy gave me his number, and I called him. We uh, met Matt up there one night and went took him to supper, and uh, I've been in touch with him quite a bit since then. And uh, by email, we'll email each other if i got questions or something, and uh I'm sure we'll see him again up there. But here's what Matt does, and this is something I just find amazing. If you really want to read about, let's say, Gettysburg, and you read some of these general works, and you say, gosh, the wheat field, man, I'd like, that was the most confusing part of the battle. Even today, nobody really totally knows what happened in the wheat field. It was seesaw. That was that 17-acre area I was sitting there. There were other parts of the battle going on, raging on at the same time as the wheat field. But there were 17 brigades, Southern and Union, that fought in the wheat field over three hours, 17,000 people, and 17 different brigades, Southern and Northern. And one minute the Northern people would take the wheat field, then the Southern. It was like trench warfare. There were no trenches, but it was like World War I where they would spend thousands of lives advancing a hundred yards. Then the other side would spend thousands of lives trying to advance to the end of a, you know, 17 football fields area, just a small place. And it, it, it was about the size if you've been to the soccer fields out um, west of town, that area about 17 acres, something like that. And there was just wholesale carnage going on there. Now, uh, Anyway, you can certainly get on these podcasts that Pennsylvania Community Network has, PCN. They have probably 70 hour to hour and a half long podcasts that go into real detail, like just the peach orchard, just the wheat field, just the little round top. So you can really learn from these things. It's amazing. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and close out, and I'll tell you, when I was there last time, uh, one of my Yankee buddies told me that uh, William Faulkner had uh, a great quote about Pickett's Charge. Has anyone read that before? It's an intruder in the dust. I know some of you have read Intruder in the Dust, but Faulkner has this, what I thought was a really moving, of course, very few people would write like Faulkner, and he said, for every southern boy 14 years of age, not just once but whenever he wants it. It's still not quite 2 o'clock on that July afternoon in 1863. The brigades are ready behind the rail fences. The guns are laid in the woods, and the furl flags are breaking out. And Pickett himself with his long, old ringlets and his hat in one hand probably and his sword in the other is looking up the hill at Longstreet waiting for the word. And it's all in the balance. It hasn't happened yet. It hasn't even begun yet. 
not only has it not begun, but it probably should not begin against those positions and those circumstances that made men like um, Armstead and Wilcox look great. But we know it's going to happen. We have come too far with too much at stake. And you don't need a 14-year-old boy to tell you that it might happen this time. Maybe this time, with all there is to win and all there is to lose, Pennsylvania, Maryland, the world, the Golden Dome of Washington itself, to crown with desperate and unbelievable victory, the desperate gamble the cast made two years ago. Thank you. I mean, the uh, peach orchard is now still a peach orchard. And uh, for a long time, the people tried to make money. They, right below the little round top, they had a train track that ran down. They had a big pavilion and a dance hall down there, right at the little round top on the battlefield. And of course, you can't tell it was ever there now. But they have done a great job at Gettysburg. They've taken down, they had some old towers up. They've taken all of, a lot of those down. Now, there's still a couple of towers that are really nice to be able to see what happened, but they're not obtrusive or anything. So they've done a great job in restoring the battlefield. And we're lucky Shiloh is probably one of the best preserved battlefields in America because it was done right after the war. It was not in a metropolitan area. And so they were able to buy the land around, or most of the land around Shiloh. And I was at uh, Fredericksburg one time at the battlefield up there taking a tour. And I asked the guy, I said, hey, where's the uh, where was that place where Joshua Chamberlain was pinned down? He said, well, it was the diesel pump on the third side of that gas station. <laughs> land on the East Coast, my goodness, it is. you think land's high around here. There's nothing here. Around the East Coast of America is just huge. I mean, just so many people that to buy a piece of land is just difficult to do. Yes, sir. Anybody have a question over there? subordinate or whatever, and I think the whole thing probably would not have occurred if Jackson had been there. If Jackson had been there, it would have, I think, would have made a huge difference. Because what happened is, after Jackson was killed, Lee, in 60 days now, reorganized the whole Confederate Army, put two guys, instead of two corps, he moved it to three corps, and 
brought in two very inexperienced, well, they were experienced, but they had never been a Corps commander. And the way Lee operated, unlike me, General Meade, the Union commander, Lee was one of these guys, he said, well, I think it'd be a good idea, General, to do such and such. That's about his, he was no pat. Lee was no get up in your face and scream at you and threaten to have you fired type guy. He was just gave a general instruction, and he led his corps and division commanders running. Jackson and he uh, had mental telepathy, I think, because they both fought uh, where they didn't have to say that. They knew, Lee knew what Jackson was thinking and vice versa, whereas these two guys, General Hill, A.P. Hill, was almost hors de combat during Gettysburg because when he had been a cadet at West Point, he got syphilis <coughs> on a weekend sometime in New York City. And uh, that syphilis, why they didn't have pills like they got now, but anyway, Hill claimed he was sick during the Battle of Gettysburg. He seemed like he was always sick when a battle occurred. I mean, he's a good commander, uh, but he had problems at Gettysburg. He didn't offer any literature from A.P. Hill. Um, and Ewell lost his leg. I mean, he had lost his leg right up to his heel. And he, this was his first battle in a long time, and his first battle as a corps commander. He provided very little in any leadership. And so everything devolved down on James Longstreet, who had a totally different philosophy than Lee did about the battle. And Longstreet and Stonewall Jackson worked well together. I think it would have been a totally different you know, I'm glad we lost the Civil War. Street wanted to move south and get between Washington and the Union Army and make the Union Army come at us on the big hill and then when we would shoot them to pieces like we did at Fredericksburg or flank them like we did at Chancellorsville. You can debate that plan all day long. It's hard to say what would have happened. Uh, we had a great victory on day one of the battle and on day two Lee tried to late in the afternoon where he did it that the Union had interior lines and could move their troops. If, if they had followed Longstreet's suggestion to move south, he would have had to have left that battlefield. And a lot of, I mean, that's a human thing is you beat them two days in a row, let's do it one more day and we'll win the whole battle. And it's just hard to disengage from an enemy like Longstreet was suggesting. I'm not saying it wouldn't have worked. I don't know. I've read a lot of stuff. Uh, I get a magazine called, you might expect, Gettysburg. It uh, comes out two or three times a year, and I read it. And people write some great articles. I don't really have the time to do that. But these people write great articles in Gettysburg Magazine, and you can get into some pretty fiery debates about that very subject because the Union Army was not just going to sit there. You know, a lot of people say, oh, all we had to do was swing south. Well, I guarantee you the Union Army could march just as well as the Southern Army when they would have perhaps been on our flank. There's no, you know, there's no telling. They had some great commanders, Winfield, Scott Hancock, and a lot of really good commanders that were highly experienced. And I'm telling you, uh, what they captured, this really caught it to me, they captured one Union colonel uh, during the battle that knew one of the big Confederate commanders like General Buell or something. And we were just slaughtering these, this Union unit. And they just stood there because they did not get an order to retreat. Everybody to their right had retreated. And imagine, they're sitting there, they're being, my great-great-grandfather was right there with them, shooting at them. And it was on the first day of the battle, it was 147 of New York, and they were sitting there because the word had not made it to them to retreat. They stood there, and they just got shot to pieces, and finally somebody got the word to them, retreat. So they fall back. And uh, one of their colonels got captured, and he knew General Ewell before the war. And uh, he said, uh, Colonel Johnson, he said, uh, what in the world were y'all doing just getting slaughtered up there? He said, you should have surrendered. So he, he looked at old General Ewell and said, General, we didn't come here to surrender. We came here to fight. And they said that the Union Army, going marching, they had been beaten. And this is what's amazing. You'll be proud that you're an American to have ancestors. 
Confederate Army that were these kind of men that when they marched up there, they had been beat. Think about it. Manassas won, Manassas two, Chancellorsville, Fredericksburg. They had been beaten it for seven days. They had never won a battle. Antietam was a draw. This army had been beaten every time it had faced the Southerners, and everybody reported when they were heading up to Pennsylvania from Virginia to fight Lee, they were full of fight. They were looking for a fight. Now, I might be looking for a fight when I was 21 years old, but it wouldn't be to get shot. I might, I might be mad at somebody and want a, just a little gentleman's fist go. But these guys were getting shot by you know, 69 caliber bullets that would just literally take your whole arm off if it hit your arm or take your leg off and fire in grape shot uh, by the thousands at you. And they were full of fight. They didn't retreat anywhere on that battlefield. Southerners were Union unless they were just getting slaughtered. There was no wholesale retreat by anybody. Yes, sir. say, oh, let's all get to Gettysburg and have a battle. It was a meeting engagement. Lee had given everybody direction, do not engage the enemy. And Harry E. coming down Emmitsburg Road ran into Buford's cavalry and they got into it. Well, you know, their blood was up. These are these are not namby-pamby people now. These are folks who get in a fight and it's a fight to the death. And so he, he kept putting men in there. Buford kept putting men in. By that time, Reynolds came they brought the Iron Brigade, and so they'd gotten this big fight there, and then, of course, Lee, when he got there, realized he had an opportunity. So this was not a planned fight. This was just a meeting engagement of small units. This sort of, it's called mission creep. You know, the, the mission starts out real small, and then before you know it, you're in a big fight, and it's easy to get in a fight. It ain't easy to get out of one. So that's what happened. They get in this meeting engagement, and it turns out that the Union ended up with the really good ground this thing, and Lee was having to try to dislodge them with the pride of the second thing. Yes, sir. Second, which is a total green unit. But they fought well, but they, they got up in the railroad and cut the first day, and a lot of them got shot up. He lived through the first day and was wounded and captured on the third day in Pickett's charge. And I think after he was taken to a prisoner of war camp, and I think he came back to Prentice County uh, after the war, and I don't think he ever got out of Prentice County again. He had satisfied his curiosity. <laughs>
funny story about that. This uh, Confederate got captured and went to Rock Island. It could have been your, your great-grandfather. He got up there, and the guards were complaining because every time he went by a Yankee, he said, boy, we sure wish you were Chickamauga, didn't we? And just, stay, you know, he just kind of followed the guard. We sure wish you were Chickamauga. And uh, so anyway, they decided they went to the colonel and said, Colonel, we got to get a real old Smith. He said, uh, he, all he talks about is just giving us hell about the Battle of Chickamauga. So why don't we let him enlist in the Union Army out west? They had that program, just like you're talking about. So that he decides he wants to get out of there. He volunteers. They put him in a blue uniform and drill him with a new rifle. And the colonel goes by there one day and says, Smith, how do you like that new uniform? Oh, colonel, look at this thing. I never had anything this nice. Brass buttons. And look at this bright, nice, shiny rifle I got. And this clean bayonet. And all. Oh, man, I've never been treated better. He said, but you know, colonel, they sure did. Anybody else have any questions? One more. I would encourage y'all also, we have a lot of stuff going on in Mississippi now. I mean, uh, believe it or not, Governor Bryant probably didn't know what my political persuasion was. He appointed me to the Mississippi Battlefield Commission. And uh, I'm on that Battlefield Commission right now. And Mississippi's got the Grant Museum down in Stark. How many have been to that and seen it? It is amazing. One of the greatest collections of Grant and Lincoln. Uh, artifacts are down there in Starkville, Mississippi. It's the presidential library for U.S. Grant. And also, they have an artillery museum in Starkville owned by a friend of mine named Duffy Neubauer. That's an amazing, it's a 
building maybe one and a half times the size of this room, but he's got just about every type of cannon that was used during the Civil War, wagons, caissons, everything. It's an amazing place. You can, you can get a tour of it, just Google it. Uh, Civil War, Starkville Civil War arson. And, and then we've got Shiloh right up here, of course, Vicksburg and all these places. But, uh, the, and I, hadn't, I haven't even been to the historical of the Civil Rights Museum in Jackson. They say they're really great. Thank y'all. Thank you.